We are so glad that you're here to join us in this time of worship, and uh, we love to do prayer and share and wish we could do it the way we always have been, but uh, we want to just recognize his birthdays and what a banner week it is for May's a busy month for babies and, uh, and for people, so we're celebrating lots of birthdays. You can see those there, and then two anniversaries as well, so we just want to congratulate those dear families, and I uh, wish we could be able to do that in person, and can't wait until we can do that together. We're going to continue in our series in Philippians, and uh, we're so, uh, it's just been such a neat time to plow through. We took some time to look at chapter 4 uh, and look at the pressing topics of anxiety and uh, finding peace in God, but resuming here in Philippians chapter 2, uh, in a very profound passage that lies before us. I think it's really hard to go it alone. It's really difficult to face life, and often we are told that we need to do this alone. And some would say that, uh, you know, you really know who someone is when they are not being watched, and to be good, and to make the right decisions when no one is watching or when it seems that no one is watching is a, is a challenging thing. So what do we do? Uh, what is our part in this grand thing called life? What is our, what is our part in it? And oftentimes you get contradictory messages. You know, you get some that just say that it's like, it's all up to you. It, it, you're the one that's got to hold this world up and it's a crazy world to hold up, isn't it? And you know, you think it all depends on you and it's your choices and you got to do it. And you got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and uh, get in there uh, and make it happen. And it can just be a lot of pressure. It can be a lot of uh, weight on your shoulders. And for some, it's a very crushing weight. It's a weight that, that seems to uh, be more than we can handle. And sometimes people are anxious because of the weight, that it seems like it all depends on us and our choices. Then it's others are saying quite, quite the opposite. It is that you're not in control, that someone or something else is. And uh, some would say, you know, it's uh, the, the, the cosmos or the universe is, is in control or, or some other mystical force or it's chaos and uh, it's not in your hands and whatever happens to you is, is not determined by you but is determined by other things and other people and events that were set in motion from far away and uh, they come cascading onto you and they simply uh, roll you over and so you're in a prison of causal forces you cannot control. And so which is it? Is it, is it, it all depends on us or is it, is it uh, that, uh, that there's so many forces that impact us? And it's into these deep and profound mysteries that we're going to come diving this morning. And uh, I think it's one of the deepest mysteries of the Christian faith. I feel like there are probably two great mysteries of the Christian faith. There's many more than two, but two that seem to rise above all the others, and that is God, freedom, and evil. How, how does uh, God, evil, and suffering, rather, and then and then God's sovereignty and his freedom, and how do they interact? Well, it's into the latter one that we're going to do a deep dive in one of the richest uh, sentences in the New Testament. And I want to just encourage you and appeal to you, if I can, to approach this with a fresh perspective uh, and maybe be willing to lay down um, some pat answers, be willing to lay down some human systems that you might have grown up with, uh, because I think sometimes the things that we bring with us into a time like this and bring with us to the Word of God uh, sometimes inhibit our ability to see what's actually there. And so we need to come with humility and with a teachable spirit. And it's in that spirit I want to begin our time in prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we come to you and we are, we are your children and you are the teacher. And Lord, you came to deliver truth and lead us into all truth and that you wanted the truth to set us free. And so, Lord, we come to sit at your feet. We come in humility and dependence, Lord, unless you open our eyes and unless you open our ears to hear and to see, we aren't going to see all that you have for us. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to come to your word afresh, anew, and to be able to listen and see with new eyes and new ears to all that you would have for us to, 
to happen. I pray, Lord, that your your word would accomplish everything that you want for it to intend for it to do in our hearts. We commit this time to you, and it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I encourage you to grab your Bibles. We're going to continue in chapter 2 of Philippians, and so we're going to read that text. And uh, it's, Therefore, uh, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but more, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So there we have it. There's the, there's the text. It's uh, one sentence in the original language. And uh, I think Christians have done more violence to this passage of Scripture than just about any other. For some that like one particular human system, they will quote one part of this sentence. And for others that like a different human system, they will quote the other. But uh, this is one unified thought and sentence, and it brings us, I think, deep into uh, an image I'm using that we are in a divine dance, I think, and uh, it's a beautiful image. Here's the purpose for our series in Philippians, that we would grow in our passion, in our purpose, and in our progress as full partners in the advance of the gospel. So, we kind of didn't, I didn't talk about that as much when we were looking at anxiety and peace, but I want to come back to that because uh, the rest of what we will talk about, uh, it really advances that. But, but so did anxiety and peace, that we're actually better partners when we're not immobilized with anxiety. And that when we have a peace that passes all understanding, we're better partners. But, but this takes us into a different piece. So here's the big idea for this morning. We must work together with God to shape our desires and our actions to culminate in his good pleasure. So there's this incredible dynamic partnership that's going on between God and and us that's laid out. And uh, and there's there's a lot of ways to get this thing wrong, but uh, what a beautiful thing it is to get it right. So let's go back to the text. Here's the the passage for us again. And uh, we're going to break this apart and walk through it very carefully, phrase by phrase, even word by word, and uh, get all that we can out of it in this time that we have. And then we're going to turn and look at how we need to apply God's life-giving truth. So uh, let's let's look at each of these uh, phrases. First, I think we need to connect the dots. I think this is one thing that, that often Christians miss, which is the connection between ideas. Uh, and uh, when there are connecting words, we need to pay attention to it. So here we have a connecting word, therefore. And, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard this a thousand times. It's probably a good thing to have repeated. When you see a therefore, it's good to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? So, we, we take the whole section that preceded this, which was that we should have this attitude, which was in Christ Jesus, who not, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a slave uh, or a servant uh, and humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, his name will be highly exalted and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, therefore, so then, then he's moving in. So the therefore is connecting the incarnation, the humiliation, the kenosis of Jesus and the emptying of himself. And uh, then it connects that to this passage. So the implication of Jesus' humble service and those inversions that we talked about earlier in the series, that he, that he is glorified, but the path to glory is through humiliation. And he has life, but the path to life is through death. And he has fullness, but the path to fullness is through emptying himself. And so uh, these are the very things that then drive him to this, which is this partnership. And so the therefore connects these two ideas. Uh, the idea here is that we need to do the right thing even if no one is looking. And he's confident that they will. So he says, therefore, my brothers, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but also in my absence. 
He expects that they will continue on as they have. So he, uh, he's expecting a good thing. This isn't always the case. This church was on the right track. Now other churches got off the right track and he had to write a different thing, like to the Galatians. He had to write, you foolish Galatians, how could you mess this up so badly so quickly? That's my paraphrase. You know, so it wasn't like, oh, keep on going and keep doing this good thing that you've already started doing, but just keep doing it better and better and you're doing such a great job. It's so positive uh, here, uh, but that's not always the case. And so uh, this is challenging, isn't it? To do the right thing even when no one is looking. Of course, sometimes people are looking when it seems like no one is looking. In fact, lots of people have gotten tripped up by that, where they acted as if no one was looking when indeed someone was looking. And, uh, and the truth will find you out. I remember my, my grandfather uh, told a story of when he was a young boy and how he learned this was uh, his dad had asked him to plant some corn and, uh, and so he <clears throat> was doing this by hand, and uh, uh, he got kind of tired of it, so he decided just to dump the whole bag in at the end of the row. And uh, later, of course, there was a nice corn tree that <laughs> grew up, and, uh, and his, his dad came out and said, well, it looks like um, you planted, you know, and then at the end, it almost looks like you just dump the whole bag and of course that's what he did and I remember he <laughs> looked at me and said beware because your sins will find you out so it, even when it appears that no one's looking no one was watching him plant the corn that day but uh but uh in the end of course it um it found it was revealed what he did and and uh this is the case that Paul wants them to do the right thing when no one's looking and when someone is so then it's go to work now here's the central command in our passage today. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's uh, that we need to go to work. We need to do our part. So let's just walk through this little phrase by phrase, word by word. So work out. So this is to put into action, to uh, be effective entirely or thoroughly in what you do. Uh, so the command is to for us to start to work this thing out. And we'll talk about what it is we're working out. It's in the reflexive, grammatically, which is emphatic of saying this is ours. Okay, so work out your own. Uh, he doesn't, reflexive is purely for emphasis. You don't need to use it. You could, he could have just said your salvation. But by using the reflexive, he's really emphasizing your own salvation. Let's just say that this is... Um, this is troubling to some Christians that, that it's there or they don't understand its import or for them it, it, it brings up uh, uh, some troubling questions. But this is a New Testament pattern. Uh, whether we like it or not and whether this fits well into your human system or not, this is a pattern of speech in the New Testament. Jesus says this. He even says to someone, your faith has saved you. I know that's something that we don't like. And if it was anyone other than Jesus, we might correct him on that and just say, <clears throat> Jesus, uh, you can't save yourself by your faith. But uh, we have here the possessive, but it's not just the possessive. It's emphatic in its reflexive, your own salvation. And Paul indeed continues this pattern. He, he talks about my gospel, we, we could say, Paul, you know, it's just the gospel. It's not yours. You didn't, you didn't. But he, but he has a pattern of speech of saying that, of, of owning it, of having ownership. So uh, man does not save himself, and that's true. Nevertheless, the inspired word of God places the emphasis here on uh, appropriate ownership. So we'll talk about that some more. So it's then our own what? Well, our own salvation. Let's spend some time looking into this. So what is this? There are so many different ways of conceiving of this. Uh, I think for, for many, there are two basic, um, two basic approaches. One is to look at it as a moment in time. So if you were to say, I'd like to hear your testimony, when were you saved? The question, when were you saved, usually presupposes that it was a moment in time. So, you know, the answer might be something like, for me, you know, it, I could say, well, that was a long process. Or, or you could say, 
it was at Bible camp, and there was a speaker, and he, uh, he laid out the gospel in a powerful and clear way, and I responded in my heart. And so you could think of that as a moment in time. But, but you can also look at that as, as a process. I think the, the passage here envisions salvation as a process, not just as an event. Because they were already saved. He already preached the gospel. They already responded. He already baptized them. He already brought them in. He already formed a church. He already had leadership. They were already saved in that sense, right? But he's telling them, he's commanding them to work out their own salvation. They're already saved. So why would Paul tell someone who's already saved to work out their own salvation? And this doesn't mean that you're saved by works. Uh, this means that, uh, that we have an active part to play with God, uh, and that is the, the command. So I, I think that um, probably in American history for Christians, we've put too much emphasis on moment in time and probably underemphasized process. The New Testament uh, clearly speaks to both. Okay, so I have both question marks. I think make room in your theology for both. I've heard some Christians say this, and I think it captures some of the biblical complexity to say, I was saved, I am saved, and I am being saved. I will be saved. And uh, the sense that not all of it, not all of the promises of God are yet mine. You know, that we live before uh, before the culmination of all of these things. And I think there's a biblical mystery that is worked out uh, here as a process. Um, And so I think I want to encourage you to make room in your heart for this. Okay, so we are to work out our own salvation, and then we can ask ourselves, well, how? How do we do that? And he tells us, in fear and trembling. Um, So some struggle with this as well. And you say, well, you know, I don't, first of all, I don't like the idea of fear and trembling. Um, and then some would push further into this. In fact, I think fear of the Lord right now is not a real popular concept. Um, we kind of swing from, from uh, kind of from one extreme to the other. And uh, there's really two ideas that God is great and God is good, that God is grand and transcendent and bigger than us and other than us and his ways are not our ways, and, but then he's also near to us. Okay, so he has, this is the eminence and the, and the transcendence of God, his, his, his otherness and his nearness. And uh, we, in general, we like a lot better his nearness, that Jesus is your buddy, that Jesus is your friend, you can see this a lot in church architecture, uh, that a lot of times churches are comfortable and welcoming and environment, whereas if you walk into, say, a cathedral in Europe with ceilings that are 300 feet high, everything there tells you God is big and grand and you are not, you are small. And uh, so when you walk into a building, it tells you something. And uh, we generally like to build buildings that are comfortable and that tell you God is near and not so much that God is big. And so uh, yet we have this, this piece. So I want someone to push on this and say, Pastor Kevin, why should I work out my salvation in fear and trembling when God says that love casts out all fear? You know, if, if, if I'm... If love casts out all fear, then why am I supposed to be afraid? So here, here this idea is, is more uh, the idea of uh, reverence or deep uh, respect. And I, and I think that, that, that indeed this is something that we have lost. That, that if Jesus is near to us and he, is our, he's, he does, he says that I do not call you slave, I... I call you my friend, and if that's true, then, then you know, some of these other things should just, just go away. And yet we're to work out our salvation in fear and trembling with an awesome sense of awe and reverence. Uh, I, I, I think Lewis nails it in the Chronicles of Narnia series, when talking about Aslan, where, where he's like, is he a good lion? They're like, yes, 
He's good. But is he a tame lion? Oh, no. No, he is not. And, uh, you know, the scene, I think they, they did a good job with the movie, too, you know, where, where the, the witch questions Aslan, and then he just growls, and she just sits down and shuts up and scoots right out of there. Uh, I think that's, that's right, because uh, he's the Lion of Judah as well. And, uh, you know, it is a fearful thing to, to, to land in the hands of a living God. And that's something that I think that often we forget and we, and we put to the side. But we're not doing any, anybody any favors by, by skipping over this. And so we do need to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. I think in, in another sense, because we have respect for God, but we also realize the stakes are high and that our decisions do matter. And uh, the implications of what we do and don't do have uh, enormous ripple effects on others. And so I think it's in fear and trembling also recognizing that the stakes are high. I think we are called here to a healthy humility with a wide-eyed recognition of our capacity to hurt ourselves and others and that we truly need to engage in our part with fear and trembling. So then the whole thing switches. Okay, so this is, this is one of the things. Uh, human systems that love to emphasize humanity's part love verse 12. Human systems that love to emphasize God's part loves verse 13. The thing is, it's one sentence, okay? So, but if you, read, if you read theological works that emphasize God's part, they will quote verse 13 as if verse 12 wasn't even a part of the same sentence. And uh, I think that is just a silly thing to do. Uh, if you're going to quote a sentence, at least look at what comes in the first half of it. And so we, here we have what God's part is. Uh, that we can play a part because God is the one who acted. And uh, so the phrase, the, the, the verbiage here in verse 13, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay, well... This is packed with meaning. So we're going to have to take this apart word by word, phrase by phrase. So first, let's start with the first word. In Greek, this is gar. This is for. And for serves either one of two purposes, one of two grammatical functions. It's either a purpose clause. So for the purpose of, or it's a ground or an explanation telling us why or how something uh, can come to be. And so, uh, in this case, I think the only possible, the only possible interpretation is the second, that it is a ground. Otherwise, we'd be saying, we are working out our salvation in fear and trembling for the purpose of God to work. But then that would be putting us in the driver's seat and God responding. And I think that would actually be heretical. Uh, that, that it's not that we first loved God, but that he first loved us and that he was the grand initiator. As while we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. We were once, we lived in darkness and we had no hope in this world and we were in mire and muck and he found us and pulled us out of that. Not that we did this on our own and then God did something after that. So it is, in this case, a ground, a reason for for. God is, the word here is actively ongoing. It's an active, ongoing, present indicative. So it's just an action that just keeps on going and it's active. For God is actively working. And that's an ongoing reality. It's not a one and done deal. It's not God did something 2,000 years ago and dusted off his hands and now he's just kind of watching it play out. This is God is actively working every day. Where? In you. Now, the you here is plural, which we don't get in English because we got rid of you plural. You know, we had a council and you guys, you know, is Milwaukee and we don't do that and we don't do y'all up here. And uh, I think we had ye, so it was here ye was our you plural. We thought that was stuffy and got rid of it. So now we don't have a you plural. But uh, if any of you could come up with one, that would be good. The word here is in you, plural. So God is working in me. God is working in you. God is working in us. 
And he's writing this letter to a church that God is working in you all. So this is how God is working. He is the, the reason that we, can, that we can do any part is because is grounded in the reality that God is actively working in all of us. So what is that working like? He says uh, the work that God is doing is to will. So God works in us to shape uh, our desires. So this, this may be a profound new idea for you. What you like is not entirely random. That your desires and that your appetites are actually something that spiritual forces fight over. God is actively working in you right now to shape your appetites and desires. And I know that that's a kind of a strange idea. But there is a pitched spiritual battle that's fought over the affections and desires and appetites of believers. And God is actively working to shape that. There are all kinds of things, right, that are an acquired taste. Do you have something like, you know, like, I love coffee. You know, I, uh, people that know me know I love coffee. I have people give me some shirts that just say, I need coffee in Jesus. I love that. Okay, so for me, a coffee was an acquired taste. I remember, like, I first uh, thought, okay, I'll, I'll kind of tip my toes into this as a camp counselor, okay, at Camp Victory, and getting up early for devotions, and it was like half coffee, half cocoa, okay? So, and then, uh, and then over time, now, and the longer I was in Europe, the stronger it, it got, but it was an acquired taste, and for some of my friends, they just, they just don't have it. They're like, I even have some friends that say, I love this smell. I can't stand how it tastes. And uh, I know some that say, I love coffee as long as there's a lot of sugar in it. Uh, And, uh, you know, as long as the coffee doesn't taste anything like coffee, then I love that coffee. And you're like, well, you, you probably don't love coffee then, right? You love sugar, which is fine. I like sugar too. But, uh, you know, it's an acquired taste. Sometimes you just don't acquire the taste, you know? And then so there's some things you can go to different places and everybody loves this and raves about it and you taste it and you're like, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but that's disgusting. You want to probably keep that to yourself if it's super popular. But uh, there's acquired taste. And so our affections don't stay put. What we like, what we want there's things as a kid that you like but then you can grow out of some of those things and uh, God is at work in us to transform what we want but God is working also to work now this is an awkward phrase at least in our language so God is working in us to work you know so you're like he's working to work Uh, isn't that a little redundant The idea here is God's work in us shapes our desires and works alongside of us to bring to completion all that we are working on. So we are working and he is working with us and we can play a part only because he created that possibility in us. If it was not for him, we would never even want to do this. That's the part where he is working on our desires in all the verses that talk about that, uh, that, that we were lost in darkness and he brought us into his marvelous light, that's all true. And he has a, a role for us to play. And, and where this is all driving, then, the intended end is uh, in accordance with his good pleasure. So, so God is commanding us to, to do our part, but he is working in us actively. He's working to transform our will and to work alongside to bring to this ultimate culmination that ends up in his good pleasure, that, that something he is pleased to do. So in the way, I, I think it is like a, it's kind of like a dance. God is the grand initiator And yet he desires for us to play a part. If God didn't want us to play a part, then we wouldn't. It's that simple. 
So I think this picture of a dance is a good one. It's a divine dance. God is the grand initiator. He is the one that started all of this. He loved us first and created the possibility of us reciprocating that love. We don't save ourselves. We didn't start anything, but it is God's good pleasure that we would join with him in this. And so uh, that is, I think, a picture of, of what God is wanting to do. I, w- I want us to, uh, to really be careful, and I want to be careful how I'm asking us to be careful, about how human systems have failed us. I think extreme forms of human system have done more damage to churches than some heresies have. And uh, I think uh, sometimes people who follow after others get more extreme than the ones who originally uh, actually articulated the systems. I think in the end of the day, what God has for us is so beautiful, is so wonderful, is so mysterious, is so grand, that it transcends the capacity of human systems to faithfully convey it. And what the human systems end up doing then is they... They do violence to either one or the other of this tension, either on the side that God is fully in control or that humanity is meaningfully into interacting with God's divine will and that our choices matter. And they're going to they're gonna end up doing violence to one or the other of those. And uh, I, I just want to illustrate this, um, and I think it's a, I think it's a good illustration. <laughs> of uh, so, okay, so here you have... Greenland, you know, and Greenland doesn't get a lot of love, you know, if you're, if you're um, probably not a lot of love. Now, this is a globe view, so this is a top-down view of, uh, of Greenland. So if you notice, there's a little blue line uh, that, I, that I use just to kind of intersect uh, about how wide Greenland is. And then I use the exact same line, I just cut and paste the same line, and stretched it from Seattle, and it gets us maybe to North Dakota, okay? Uh, that's about how wide Greenland is there. Now, that's on a globe. That's on a sphere. Now, many of you grew up with maps, and there's a difference, isn't there, between a three-dimensional sphere and a two-dimensional map. When you take a three-dimensional sphere, and then you try to translate that into a two-dimensional map, this is what we get. So here's a world map. Greenland's in blue. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but Greenland's a little bigger than it was the last time we looked. Uh, the red line is uh, the approximate width, and you cross it, and instead of getting you to North Dakota, it gets you all the way to New York. Uh, so in this two-dimensional map, Greenland's almost 2,000 miles wider than it was. You know, like, how did that happen? It happens because a two-dimensional map is not a three-dimensional globe. And you cannot, you cannot take a three-dimensional sphere and put it onto a flat image without distorting the image. It's impossible. The only thing you can do is pick where the distortion will occur. Now, in this case, you know who bought this map, who paid for this map? America did. So you know what is perfect in both? America is perfect. The dimensions are exact, and uh, there's no error, there's no distortion, uh, and the people, the cartographers who did this say, you know what, uh, we got to have a distortion. What place doesn't matter? Greenland. Greenland doesn't matter. And of course, I'm sorry to all of you that are in Greenland. Uh, and uh, I looked it up and uh, it's not that many. So the odds of offending someone are pretty low. But, uh, you know, so it's like, well, Greenland doesn't matter. America matters. So America's going to be right, and Greenland is going to be way off. I don't know if you can notice this. Let's see, I can do a, a little pointer here. Which one's the pointer? In the middle? There we go. They did a little Greenland over Africa. Uh, <laughs> Greenland's nowhere near that big. Uh, if you lay the actual Greenland over Africa, it covers up about two or three countries. Uh, it's nowhere near about the same size as Africa. 
Uh, and it's just, it's kind of an ethnocentric thing. It's like, we're really important, so ours is going to be accurate, and other places of the world aren't that important, so theirs is going to be wrong. And I, I think this is, a, I think, a really good illustration of what happened, is that, that God's revelation is the three-dimensional sphere. That God's revelation, His categories, that the, the Holy Spirit uh, effectively conveyed these transcendent ideas. He, it was a mysterious, also a mysterious partnership between human authors and, and the Holy Spirit that conveyed uh, God's revelation to us and uh, it's a sphere. But then come along human systems after that. And they take a sphere and they're like, okay, well, we have to take this and, and, and shift it and shake it. But then what they end up doing is they end up distorting. They get some things right, but they get some things wrong. And they get the things right that they like. And they get the things wrong that they don't care about. The, the errors are not random. They're based on our preferences. They're based on our values. And, uh, and, and those things get made accurate. This is exactly what's happened with human systems. And that one will go over here and say, well, we're going to get one thing right. It's going to be human responsibility. And uh, or maybe they prefer the term freedom or agency. Whatever their favorite words are to talk about, the reality in the first part of our verse that we are commanded to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling because God is at work in us. So that we're going to get this right. And if we get a little bit wrong in God's sovereignty, that's okay. That's their Greenland. It's okay if it's three times as big as it really is. And then there are others that are going to get God's sovereignty right. And if they make nonsense out of the commands that are given to us, that's an acceptable price to pay so long as they get this thing right. But let me suggest to you that, that both mistakes aren't necessary if we go back to God's revelation, which does not do that. And when we simply can't put it into a two-dimensional object, let's just admit that we can't and, uh, and not try to, but distort anyway. So when we look at the summary, here's my best attempt to summarize what this verse says. That God's working in us creates the capacity and the desire to actively and dynamically partner with him in which, as he works in us to shape our desires, we actively work out in fear and trembling our salvation because he's already been actively working in us to create that very possibility. As we work together in this dynamic partnership, God's good pleasure is brought to perfect completion. That, I think, harmonizes the two sides of this deep and profound mystery. Now let's look at how we need to live then. And how we can live out God's life-giving truth. There's so much here for us, I think. And sometimes people go to this verse as a proof text to prop up their favorite system and fail to actually live it out. So rather than letting this just be a battleground over God's sovereignty and human freedom, let's actually try to obey it and live it out. So... What should we do then? First of all, I think just believe that God is working in you when you can see it and when you can't. When you can feel it and when you can't. God might actually be doing some of his most effective work in you when you have the hardest time believing that it's happening. Sometimes our perception of what God is doing doesn't line up with the reality and there's sometimes when it is an act of faith, just to believe, I believe that what God said is true, that he is actively working in me every day when I can feel it and when I can't, when he feels near and when he feels far, that God is working in you. Believe it. Take hold of that. God is working in you. Certainly he could do things faster if he decided he wasn't going to work with us. But he has chosen to dance with us, even if it takes longer to do. Do the right thing, even when no one's looking, because God sees. And it seems like it's also true that sooner or later, 
people see too. And uh, there's a lot of verses that talk about that. But here Paul says, calls this church to keep up the good work of doing the right thing when he's there and when he's not, when someone's watching and when someone's not. Some would say who you are is really revealed when no one else is watching or when you believe no one else is watching. So who are you when the supervision is gone? Who are you? Young people, maybe that, that gets played out in a transition as you leave home and go to college. And then you decide, is this my faith? Is this, what are my choices? What are my values? And who you are when mom and dad aren't watching is going to help define who you really are and calls us up to do the right thing when someone's watching and when someone's not. I just encourage you to refuse to use bad maps. Don't, don't reduce God's grand mystery uh, to something that um, simply cannot capture it. And I, and I, I see this happening so often. And uh, it, it's crazy. Just even this one verse. I, dozens of times I've heard one half of the sentence quoted against the other. As, as if the two things had nothing to do with each other. And you're like, what an absurd thing to do with God's word. It's one sentence. It's one unified sentence. And he's capturing both sides of this tension. It's not one or the other. Uh, and uh, I would just encourage you to not hang on to a human system with such white knuckles that you can't open your hand to the grander mystery of God. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, the people that I respect the most end up being able to hold these things in tension rather than clutching on to, to human systems. Uh, God is at work in us and we must play our part as he is working in us. So we have a part to play. I, I know some of these things are common. Sometimes you say, let go and let God. And, and, and maybe in some circumstances, that's a good thing. But uh, this verse, the command, the central command is work out your own salvation. So this calls us to take appropriate ownership. This is this, and I, maybe that's something that just seems strange to you. Like my salvation, it's not, not what, what is it? I mean, it's a gift that God gave. Yes, it is. But, but there's also this your, and, and he goes like as far as he can grammatically to, to put the emphasis that this is yours. You have a part to play. You cannot passively sit by and let others do this. That means that your growth as a Christian is your responsibility. It's not your mom and dad's. It's not the church's. It's not other spiritual mentors that each of us needs to take responsibility to uh, carry out our part in this. Yes, God is working in us. And if it wasn't for that, none of the rest would have ever been possible. But we need to do our part. That is indeed the command of the passage. So we need to obey it. We need to take appropriate ownership of this partnership. Uh, and, and just say, okay, I'm going to do my part. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't tell you in every instance what that part is uh, because th that requires a, a deep, deep understanding of your heart. But that we need to press into this to take appropriate ownership. One of the, one of the deficiencies of one human system that constantly emphasizes that God is in control is it's very hard to make any sense out of the idea that we are working this out or that we have a responsibility to do that. Um, and uh, it often encourages passivity and letting God do this thing since he's in control and he's doing it and I can't. Uh, you know, so we're being called to, to play a part here. I would encourage you, as the text does, to develop a deep and profound reverence and awe for God. That's a, a fair translation for fear and trembling. Even a healthy fear. Not a fear that paralyzes us, but a, a fear that would lead us to praise Him. Let me just ask, how big is your Jesus? You know, for some, Jesus is so near and he's our friend and he's our buddy. And, and uh, you know, Rebecca and I joke all the time that like the kinds of things we put on mugs and posters, you know, are always like these happy things, you know, you know, blessed. And, you know, you, you, never, you never hear 
and they will be thrown out into, into the darkness and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You, you never see that on a mug, do you? You know, and you're like, why is that? Or on a poster, you know? And you're like, why is that? Because we don't like it. It's scary. It, it's like, well, there could be judgment or, you know, and you're like, yes, the stakes are high. And Jesus says hard things. Jesus looks right at a man. He healed and says, stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. You're like, well, my Jesus wouldn't say you say that. Well, the real Jesus did. And if your Jesus wouldn't say things the real Jesus did, you got to ask a deeper question is, are you even worshiping the same Jesus as in the Bible? Because he deserves reverence and respect and awe. Maybe as a practical exercise, you could just read Revelation chapter 1 and just look at who he is and just say, could you... Could you develop awe and reverence as the Apostle John did as he fell on his face as a dead man before a glorious Christ whose eyes were a blazing fire and whose voice was of many waters? And so there, you, know, you can go to Isaiah and his vision uh, of God and uh, how he fell on his face. Or to Daniel, there is plenty of places where the, where the, where the veil is opened up a little bit and we can see the transcendent glory of God, and it calls us to a deep and profound awe and reverence for God. If there's no place in your spirituality for fear of God, then uh, I think you, you need to create some room to grow there because it's a very biblical and godly thing. Not that paralyzes us, but propels us to worship. Invite God to rule and reign in the areas of your desires and appetites. I think this is one of the most practical applications. So if you've checked out for the whole rest of the sermon and you do this, I think you still got to win. Just invite God to say, Lord, you take control of my desires and appetites. And just look at some of the things you want. This could be literal, like as in food, you know, like maybe there are self-destructive patterns you're engaging in or... Maybe this is in a, in a broader sense of appetites, the things you watch, uh, the company that you spend time with. And uh, there could be lots of applications to this, but, but I would invite you, if you want to do a prayer of application, just start praying to God, inviting Him to rule and reign in your life. It's, it's kind of like praying the Lord's Prayer. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in my heart, in my life. Lord, you rule my appetites. You rule what I desire, and uh, invite him to be at work in your life. Invite him to transform your desires, and he will. And you'll find that you will have a growing desire. I think, you know, for some, for some Christians, they, they sometimes lose appetite for his word. But, uh, but that's something that can be quickened as well until you can't, uh, you can't wait. Maybe that's happened for us with meeting together, I think, for many of us. It's like, I can't wait. And maybe what he's done is we've had to fast from that for a little bit, and he's quickened our appetite to meet together. And now we could say with the psalmist, I cannot wait to dwell in the courts of the Lord and to be there with his people. Let's just spend just a moment or two imagining what would happen if we and God's people said, we want to grab hold of this verse. We want to do this. We, we, want, to, we want to obey. Could you, could you imagine if someone who had been told that it all depended upon them, that it was all based on their effort and their work and, their, and they, they just couldn't do it and they were so tired and it's like they just couldn't do it anymore. They, they just couldn't move forward anymore. And they're so exhausted because they're trying to do all of this in their own strength and their own power. And then they heard this verse that it said, yes, you have a part to play, but it's because that God is actively, effectively working in you and is transforming your desires and he's transforming and working alongside you to bring those things into completion. Could you imagine if someone, let's say a young woman, heard this and had heard let go and let God and had slipped into passivity in her spiritual life and uh, her spiritual life was kind of on autopilot and she was just coasting on the faith of others 
And then she heard this, that God was commanding her to play a part for, to, that she would begin to take appropriate ownership and begin to actively work out her own salvation, even as God's working in her, that she understood that I cannot just put this on autopilot, that I need to play a part here, and I can't blame my lack of spiritual vitality on this group or that group, on this church or that church. I need to do my part. And she did, and God met her in that place. And they grew, and God grew her. Could you imagine could you imagine if someone submitted and just said, God, I, I want all kinds of things I shouldn't want. I have all kinds of appetites and I eat things and they aren't good for me. I, I ingest spiritual things that are not good for me. Lord, would you just take control? Would you transform my appetites and my desires so that I want the good thing? Paul said, these good things I want to do, I don't always do them. These bad things I don't want to do, those I do. And so he says, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? What, could you imagine if somebody prayed that prayer and God showed up in that space and said, yes, I will transform those desires. And so that you want things that are good for you. You want things that will give life rather than taking it. Could you imagine if a church that became so enthralled with a particular human system that they couldn't embrace the grander mystery of God. And their, their infatuation with this human system almost became greater than their affection for God's word. And human authors were quoted almost with as much authority as God's word. And then they read this passage which said both and held these things in tension and they repented of their fixation with the particular human system, and they embraced the grander mystery of God. They looked at these maps that had distorted certain realities that they considered unimportant, and they cast them aside and embraced God's grander vision, and it led to greater harmony and unity in God's people. A church split that was about to happen was stopped in its tracks because they held God's word in higher reverence than a human system. Can you imagine what new freedom would be allowed as they go deeper and deeper into God's good pleasure for them? That is indeed what we want. Uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, we invite you to have your way in us. We thank you so much that you're at work in us actively. Lord, if you weren't, we would have no hope in this world. <clears throat> but you have and you will complete this good work that you have begun. So Lord, we come to you and I ask that you would work in each individual heart who's going to hear this. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you call them to take specific steps of obedience relative to their next step? Lord, would you impress upon their heart what they need to do with this today? And that they would not just put it off and not just say, oh, that's nice. But they would actively obey your word and partner with you in the transformation of their desires as you work together with us, Lord, so that your good pleasure would be brought to perfect completion in each and every one of your people. That is our prayer, Lord. We ask that, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we invite you to come back and worship with us. We are continuing to work on what that's going to look like. But we're going to do something. And we'll be in contact and, uh, and uh, letting our folks know about how specifically we will be worshiping as uh, the dynamic picture of restrictions unfolds. So stay tuned both to what this will look like and the next uh, time we have to worship together. God bless.